Father, we just thank you for today. Thank you for your power. Thank you for the opportunity to come to worship. Thank you for the word of life, the Bible. Thank you for the truth. We ask you receive thanks and praises in Jesus' name. We are here again to look at your word. I pray you open our eyes of understanding. Reveal your truth to us. Give us an open heart. Don't allow us to be like the fool that will say there is no God. Cause us to know that you are there and that you are still alive today to save, to deliver, to preserve. Guide us in your word this morning. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We welcome every one of us to our search the scriptures this morning. In our last search the scriptures last Sunday, we considered the topic titled Marriage and Family Life of Christians. Marriage and Family Life of Christians. In that study, we learned a lot. Actually, the message uh, affected and touched every class of people. The youths that are still planning in the future for their marriage, those who are of age of marriage praying for the leading of God in marriage, and those who are in courtship already, hoping that very soon they will have their family uh, eventually uh, created. We also, the message touched those who are married already, either recently or those who have married for years. The message was applicable to everybody. And in that study, we saw that marriage happens to be one of the most sacred institutions in life, and it is a joining together of a man and a woman in holy matrimony. Uh, marriage is not for teenagers, not for children. It's for men and women of age. Marriage is not between 
a man and a man. It is between a man and a woman. Marriage is not between a woman and a woman. It's still for a man and a woman. Marriage is not between human beings and animals. And we realize that the marriage is the beginning of a family life. Marriage is the beginning of the family life. We also uh, told that as Christians, we should be guided by God. Because God knows every heart. God knows who will fit your life, who will help you to achieve your goals, your purpose and plan in life. That's the reason why we need to seek his face in prayers for guidance and direction. And as we do, God is always available to answer our prayers and to guide us aright. We realize as well that marriage is God's plan and program from the beginning. It didn't start today. And nobody dare change it. It is a divine necessity. And God planned marriage for the preservation of purity and also and holiness both in the church and in our society. God doesn't want a corrupted society, doesn't want a corrupted church. Marriage also, it works for the completeness and fulfillment of true living. And we realize as well that marriage provides the needed fellowship, comfort, companionship, and partnership. Because at the beginning, God said it is not good for a man to be alone. The same way it is not good for a woman to be alone. Marriage also complements God's work of procreation. I pray that all that we learned will be applied in our lives and the blessings that follow marriages will come into our lives in Jesus' name. Today, we are returning back to the Old Testament studies. Uh, our volume 74 of the search the scripture has already ended last Sunday. We are now in a new volume, volume 75. We encourage every one of us to endeavor to have a copy. It's already available. Now, today, we are now back to the book of Psalms again. We have today Psalm 14, 15, and 53. We are going to consider. And our topic is titled Conditions for Fellowshipping with God. Can you say that after me? Conditions for fellowshipping with God. That's the topic we have today, and it is lesson 963. Our memory verse is taken from Psalm 15, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 15, verses 1 and 2. We are going to take it together after the count of two. One, two, go. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and picket the truth in his heart. That's Psalm 15, verses 1 and 2. Our text again, Psalms 14, 
15 and 53. We are going to read through. Psalm 14. I will read from here. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge? Who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord? There were they in great fear, for God is in the generation of the righteous. Ye have shamed the counsel of the poor, because the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion when the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people. Jacob shall rejoice and Israel shall be glad. Psalm 15. I read from verse 1 through to verse 5. It says again, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that dwelleth to his own heart and changeth not. He that putteth not his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Praise the Lord. We'll go to Psalm 53. I read from verse 1 to verse 6. Psalm 53, verse 1 to verse 6. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Corrupt are they and have, not, and have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. Every one of them is gone back. They are all together become filled. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge? Who eat up my people as they eat bread? They have not called upon God. There were they in great fear, where no fear was, for God has scattered the bones of him that encamped against thee. Thou hast put them to shame. Because God had despised them. Verse 6. Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion. When God bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice and Israel shall be glad. Praise the Lord. The Lord will make us to rejoice and be glad. Today's study reminds us of God's original plan for creating man. 
That is to have constant and uninterrupted fellowship with man. That's the original plan of God. That he wants to relate with man. We are told that he always visits Adam at the cool of the day to fellowship, to relate, to interact. Unfortunately, due to man's disobedience, due to man's um, sin, we lost this privilege. The privilege was truncated at the Garden of Eden because Adam disobeyed God. And not only that, of that of disobedience at the Garden of Eden, from that time to this present hour, we realize that mankind continued to drift away from God. They kept on going far away, far away, far away, becoming more wicked, more corrupt, having no regard for the will of God, having no regard for the way of God, having no regard for the commandments of God. Of course, when this happened during the period of Noah, what was the consequence? The consequence was that judgment came. As we look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Verse 12, he says, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his own way upon the earth. That's what brought the judgment, the flood, that actually swept off mankind, and incidentally, it was Noah and his family that was left at that time. Incidentally, the wickedness, the corruption, the evil has continued to thrive in the world. And that has separated us between us and our God. Thank God that God is a God of mercy, a God of compassion, who wouldn't want his creation to perish. And as a result of that, he has worked out a redemption plan, a restoration plan, so that we can return back to fellowship with our God. The fellowship we lost at the Garden of Eden, the Lord wants us to reclaim it, enjoy it on this earth, and hereafter, after we have left this world. Now, question number one. Now, explain why man fell out of favor and fellowship with God. I've already mentioned it. One is because of the disobedience at the Garden of Eden. Two, because we continue to drift away from God, going into wickedness, going into corruption, disregarding the word of God, not realizing he is our creator. This study will be divided into three parts. Point number one, condition of the fallen man. Number two, cure for the sinfulness of man. Number three, candidates for a heavenly fellowship. Now we take point number one, condition of the fallen man. The passages we have read in Psalm 14, uh, let me just read chapter 14, verse 1 again. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. None that doeth good. Good among the sons of men, anyone that has never had contact 
with our Lord Jesus Christ, none doeth good. That's what the conclusion of the scriptures. And the sinful man after the fall degenerated into different classes of denial of the Creator. And some now chose all forms of ideologies and religion. Some are called the atheists. This class of people are the people that say they don't believe that God exists at all. They don't believe that God, there is God. And we have another class of people again that profess agnosticism. These people claim that it is difficult or impossible to know whether God exists or not. They are also wrong. We have this also the pantheists. And what they project in their own ideology is that uh, God and the universe are the same. And some other ideologies and other people that came up with all forms of error and belief and they want to show that God is not in existence. But the scripture classifies all of them as fools. That's the conclusion of the scriptures. From the passage I read to you in uh, Psalm 14, verse 1. Man has continued in corruption and different forms of abomination with no fear or regard for the Creator and His laws. The doom of people who do not believe that there is God are set forth in some of the texts we have just read. Those who does not believe in the existence of God will definitely face the judgment of God at a later time. As we look at um, Psalm 53, where we have read before, let's look at Psalm 53, and I read from verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God, corrupt are they, and have not done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. Every one of them is gone back. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no not one. Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge? Who eat up my people as they eat bread? They have not called upon the name of the Lord. Now verse 5. There were they in great fears. Those people, they were there in great fears. Where there is no fear. For God has scattered the bones of him that encamped against thee. Thou hast put them to shame because God despised them. God despised them. That's the scripture. The root of atheism in the heart uh, actually starts in the inner being of man. From the account of what the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, it says there, because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish hearts foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So, atheism, those who profess there is no God, 
It begins in the heart. And that's why we must watch over our heart. The Bible says we should keep our heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. We do not uh, open up our heart to false doctrine, to unbelief, to doubt, to whatsoever the devil wants to implant in our heart. The effect on the character and the speech and the actions of all these people is very, very disastrous. It ends in great fear and torment, but when Jesus is embraced as Lord and personal Savior, the light of the glorious gospel dispels the darkness of unbelief and ushers in the knowledge of the Almighty God. Let's see from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I read in verse 4, In whom the God of this world had blinded their minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. Now we have another question before us. Question number two. He says, what is the condition of those who have lost fellowship with God? What is the condition of those who have lost fellowship with God? So many. But uh, let's give you this few. One, they have already gone aside from the law of God and they have become filthy and worthless. That's what the Bible says in Psalm 14, verse 3. We also see that they become workers of iniquity. They practice sin freely, without restraint, without hindrance. That's the condition of the person that has lost fellowship with God. Number three, they call not upon the Lord, but serve false gods. They, will, they said they don't believe in the existence of the Almighty God, the great Creator, but at the same time, they are serving stones, iron, wood, and some other creatures, images. And number four, we see they live in great fear and insecurity. That's the reason why they go and join courts join society because they are in great fear. They need protection. Having lost the fellowship with the Almighty God. Number five, we see they profess themselves to be wise and they became fools. That's what Romans chapter 1 verse 22 says. Number six, they change the glory of incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. They make image idols and go to worship. Number seven, we see also that God eventually gave them up. Since they don't want to retain the knowledge of God, they don't want God, they don't want the fellowship of God, they don't want the glory of God, God gave them up. Go and do whatever you want to do. He gives them up to uncleanness, to dishonor themselves. And that's why you see human beings uh, relating with man to man, woman to woman. They go to sodomy. And sometimes you see human beings interacting with animals because God gave them up. Also, we see that they are filled with all unrighteousness and other sins. So many of them. Number nine, they have pleasure in them that do unrighteousness. They praise those who are doing evil. They give applause to those who are doing evil. They support. Those are the people that give great commendation. 
And then, number 10, they are condemned to eternal damnation, except they repent before they die. If they don't repent before they die, if they didn't, they didn't embrace the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, they will be damned forever and ever. Now, what is the cure of the man's sinfulness? What provision did God make for the cure of man's sinfulness? That takes us to point number two, cure for sinfulness of man. Cure for sinfulness of man. In view of the facts expressed about the fallen man as one who is filled with all unrighteousness, coupled with the general prevalence of iniquity, the psalmist cries out for salvation and deliverance. In Psalm 14, Psalm 14, verse 7, it says, Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion, when the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people, Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. That's the cry of the psalmist, and it's still the cry today. Not only for Jacob and Israel, for the entire world, everybody in the world. Oh, that the salvation of the world the salvation of every sinner might come from the Lord. There's no salvation in any other except in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the cure. That's the solution of the sinfulness of man. This, with no doubt, is the obvious cure of sin. Zion is synonymous with the city of David. If you look at 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 7, you will realize that the Bible spoke about the city of David, which is Jerusalem, where the Lord has put his name. Because salvation, deliverance come through our Lord Jesus Christ the only Son of God that God has given to us for the redemption of mankind. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of David. Jesus Christ is the only way for salvation. Now, repentance and remission of sin through faith in the atoning blood of Jesus Christ brings us back to the fellowship we lost at the Garden of Eden. That's very clear. In Hebrews chapter 9, I read in verse 28. Hebrews chapter 9 and in verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Clearly confirmed here that Christ bore our sins. He took away our sins. And anybody that embraced him Anybody that comes with a true heart, open heart, to Jesus Christ will definitely receive salvation and restoration to fellowship with God. When a sinner or a backslider realizes his or her sinful state, repents and accepts Jesus as Lord and Savior, he or she, 
will be cured from the disease of sin. He will be restored to fellowship with the Father according to what the scripture tells us. In 1 John, open your Bible with me. In 1 John chapter 1, I read in verse 3. 1 John chapter 1 and in verse 3. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the confirmation by the apostles, the disciples of old, that had made Christ. They said their fellowship is with the Father and with Jesus Christ. If we uh, surrender our lives to Christ today, we are also going to have the same experience. I pray that the Lord will open our hearts, those who are still far away, to come nearer and receive Christ as their Lord and their Savior. That takes us to the final point, and that is candidates for the heavenly fellowship. Candidates for the heavenly fellowship. The scriptures characterizes those who would have fellowship with God here on earth. Not everybody. The sinful will never have fellowship with him. The backslider will never have fellowship with him. The wicked will never have fellowship with him. The one that does not believe in his existence will never have fellowship with him. Not only here on earth, also hereafter in heaven. The scripture outlines those who will also dwell with him eternally, that will stay with him in heaven. Because life will definitely end one day. And so, King David had to ask uh, an eternally important question, which you may not ask yourself, but this question is very, very pungent, very, very important. We need to always reflect on it. It should be on our lips every time. And that question is, in Psalm 15, Psalm 15, I read in verse 1. Psalm 15 in verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? An important question to you, an important question to me, an important question to everybody. Who will abide in God's tabernacle? Who will dwell in his holy hill? Of course, the answer came almost immediately. He put forth this question in view of the corruption and degeneracy of mankind, which we have already seen from chapter 14. When he looked at the level of wickedness, how man has degenerated to evil, coming to the point that he doesn't believe in the existence of his creator, that's the reason why he asked this question. When he looked at all what is going on in the world today, he looked at the terror that goes on, the hate that goes on, the wickedness that goes on, the greed that goes on, the corruption that goes on, the morality that goes on. That's the reason why he was asking the question, who will abide in his tabernacle? That is to ask, what are the qualities? What are the demands that will allow God to permit us to be with him over there in heaven? at the last day, knowing that death 
will definitely come to everyone on the face of the earth. As the Bible says, it is appointed unto man once to die after this judgment. So that's the reason why this question came up. And incidentally, the Lord provided answers. Let me ask this question now. Question number three. Mention the essential qualities, essential qualifications of those who will abide in fellowship with God here and hereafter. Well, let me just give you answer from here. One, from the passage we read in Psalm 15, in verse 2, he said that person must walk uprightly. Walk uprightly. Meaning that there is no crookedness in his lifestyle, no dishonesty in his uh, business and lifestyle. It means such an individual walks according to the truth of the gospel. His life is free of guile, deception, and hypocrisy. Number two, those who will dwell with the Lord and fellowship with God in eternity. And here too, he that worketh righteousness. The works of such a believer are characterized by faith and righteousness of Christ. He is also full of good works, of sharing the gospel, helping, giving to the needy, touching lives of other people positively. Number three, we see also he speaks the truth in his heart. There is sincerity and honesty of speech in his life. He does not speak with double tongue, double heart, meaning one thing and saying another thing having another intention and saying another thing. Number four, he backbited not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. That we see from verse three, he is not a slanderer, a defamer, or one who secretly destroys another's reputation. Number five, he abhors evil and evildoers. No matter their status and position in life, the only thing of concern to him is to reach them with the gospel of grace of God. On the other hand, he honors the saints of God no matter how poor they are. Now, we also see in number six, he upholds his covenant and consecration to the service of God. He doesn't say, I will serve God, and in the middle of the way, he turns backward. He continues to the end. Without wavering, whatever happens, he serves the Lord. No matter the situation we are in the world now, because he wants to fellowship with God both here and forever, the circumstances in the world does not change his covenant and consecration. is not given to change. According to Proverbs chapter 24, verse 21, he put it not out his money to usury, that is collecting interest from people that are poor, who wants money for their children's school fees, or money to feed, or what to borrow money to uh, uh, pay house rent. But then, at the same time, the usually here does not mean that if somebody is going to do business and want to borrow a large amount of money to do business from bank, that he should not pay interest. It's only according to Exodus chapter 22, 25, from your poor brethren. You should not take usury. And so, 
as we see, the Bible says, He that doeth these things in Psalm 15 and in verse 5, He that doeth these things shall never be moved. Whatever happens, shall never be moved. This answers the question of who will dwell in the holy hill of the Lord. Final question. Uh, what are the benefits of keeping the laws of God? In James chapter 1, James chapter 1, I read um, from verse 25. James chapter 1, verse 25. For whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. This man shall be blessed in his deed. That's why the question comes, what are the benefits of keeping the laws of God? One, we see that the person has the peace of mind. He's settled with God. He has the peace of mind with God. Number two, there is hope and assurance of eternity with God in heaven. He has hope. He has an assurance. He's not dying without hope. Then number three, it assures us of continuous fellowship with the Father and with the Son. And finally, uh, we see that uh, it will now grant us the abiding presence of God on a daily basis in our lives. The presence of God will always abide with us. We have heard the word of God this morning about the conditions of um, having fellowship with the Lord. The question is, have you actually repented? Have you accepted Jesus Christ? Are you among the fools? But if you are in that category today, you still have an opportunity to repent. You still have opportunity to turn over to the Lord. Let's rise up as we pray to the Lord in prayers. Commit yourself into God's hand. Pray that God will help you. God will support you. God will assist you to be able to know that there is a creator. Don't be a fool. And don't join the companies of fools. Don't be among those who say there is no God. And also, if you're a believer, continue to remain in the kingdom. Because there is a fellowship with God here, and there is fellowship with God hereafter. Father, we just thank you because of what you have taught us this morning. We praise you because of your word. We praise you because of your truth. Ask that the word will have impact in our lives. Turn us around. Draw us closer to you. Do this and receive glory, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen.